Should we worry about our insulin levels rising after eating? What's sometimes called insulin spikes. Anytime we talk about glucose or insulin levels, we have to make a key distinction. Are we talking about fasting levels or are we talking about levels after eating, also known as postprandial levels? If my fasting glucose is high, I just woke up, I haven't had any food in eight or 10 hours, and my glucose level is high, that's a problem. That's not controversial. There's something off with my metabolism. I might have prediabetes or maybe even full-blown type 2 diabetes. Similarly, if my fasting insulin level is high, that's not a good sign. It's a red flag. It's indicative of insulin resistance. Okay, what about eating? It's normal for glucose levels to change, to go up after a meal. That's called a glucose excursion. In a completely normal, healthy person, glucose will go up and it'll come back down. Glucose excursions can also happen during exercise, especially intense bouts. They also happen during phases of sleep. So it's a completely physiological phenomenon. So glucose level rising acutely, not necessarily a problem, but glucose level staying high chronically, that's the issue. Okay, what about insulin? Insulin levels also rise after a meal. Is that good or bad? Should we try to keep our insulin levels flat at all times? There are a number of ideas about insulin that have been proposed, and specifically about postprandial insulin, this insulin spike after a meal. One idea that has been suggested is that insulin spikes might trigger an anabolic state with storage of fat mass and consequently weight gain. Another idea is that insulin spikes might cause peripheral tissues of the body to become resistant to the action of the insulin, triggering insulin resistance, and maybe even raising risk of developing type 2 diabetes. A brand new study that just came out looked at all of these ideas. They recruited around 300 women and they measured their insulin response to a glucose challenge. So you give people a defined amount of glucose in liquid form, they drink it, and then you wait some time and you measure the insulin levels in their blood. And they calibrated everybody's insulin level to the same person's glucose level. So they measured several parameters in the participants and in the beginning of the study, what's called the baseline, the participants that had the bigger insulin spikes had mixed results. Some parameters were better and some parameters were worse. So for example, their waist circumference was larger, inflammatory markers were elevated, and their insulin resistance was also higher compared to the participants that had the shorter insulin spikes. On the other hand, their beta cell function was improved. So beta cells are the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin those cells had a better function in the participants with the larger insulin spikes. And they also had lower fasting glucose and lower postprandial glucose than the folks that had the shorter spikes. Now, this is all baseline data, which is in general not very informative with regards to cause and effect relationships because it's just one time point. It's what we call cross-sectional data. So it doesn't allow us to tell what came first. Also, this is raw data, unadjusted for anything. So then they started the study proper and they followed these participants for four years. So it's a prospective study, which is methodologically stronger. And they measured all of those parameters over time. And they also adjusted their results for other diabetes risk factors to try to exclude those from the equation and try to isolate this insulin spike variable. And what they report is that the participants that had the largest insulin spikes went on to have better beta cell function over time, lower fasting glucose, and lower postprandial glucose than the participants with the shorter insulin spikes. But the most interesting observation was that they had lower risk of developing prediabetes or type 2 diabetes over those four years of follow-up. And it was a big difference. It was a five-fold risk reduction in the individuals with the largest insulin spikes. Other parameters like BMI, waist circumference, inflammatory markers, insulin resistance, and lipids were not significant between people with different size insulin spikes. So these results don't seem to support the idea that insulin spikes cause weight gain or insulin resistance, and they seem to go against the idea that insulin spikes raise risk of diabetes. The authors concluded a robust post-challenge so challenge, they're referring to the glucose intake, the glucose bolus that is given to the participants. So a robust post-glucose challenge insulin secretory response does not indicate adverse cardiometabolic health, but rather 
predicts favorable metabolic function in the years to come. I think one possibility is that the size of these insulin spikes might be serving as an indicator of pancreatic vigor, so to speak. So participants with a healthier pancreas would have a larger insulin spike, which would make sense that they would then have lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes over time, and vice versa. Those with the smallest spikes might have less pancreatic reserve and have higher risk of developing diabetes over time. Whether this is the real explanation or not, the results argue against the idea that insulin spikes cause all of these issues because people with the largest spikes, if anything, had lower risk of disease. In the words of a researcher who commented on the findings, this research challenges the notion that high post-meal insulin levels are inherently bad. So it's a really interesting study with some provocative findings. Obviously, as always, we don't settle an issue by looking at one study. We want to keep an, an eye out for any incoming data that agrees or disagrees with this. Also, we want to look at the limitations of the study. Every study ever conducted has strengths and limitations, and this one has some significant limitations. First, it's an observational study. It's not randomized. Second, all the participants were women, and they were all recent mothers. The follow-up started one year after these women gave birth. So we have to be careful extrapolating the results. In science, you always want to test something in different populations to make sure that it's generalizable. And third, they didn't look at the participants' diets. They studied their insulin spikes in response to this defined dose of glucose. So we have to be careful extrapolating that this means diet XYZ is going to have this result or that result. One example of a trial that is interesting to compare is diet fits, which we've talked about here many times, and it was a randomized trial looking at dietary interventions. One group was randomized to a higher carb, the other to a higher fat diet, and their changes in body weight over one year, which was the time of follow-up of that trial, was not explained by their insulin spikes in response to a defined dose of glucose. So that result seems to align well with the result of this study, but we want to look at broader data sets and see things align in general. I guess what I'm saying is I haven't seen enough studies, enough evidence, enough consistency to be convinced that this is indeed the case, but we'll keep an eye on this field going forward and see if uh, future evidence is concordant or not. Here's another interesting thing with regards to insulin spikes. I think this will surprise a lot of viewers. What foods cause insulin spikes? Most people would say carbs. And carbohydrate does have that effect. It does have this insulinogenic effect. But carbohydrate is just one factor. And we don't eat carbohydrates. We eat foods that have a mix of nutrients. And scientists have tested this systematically, giving people different foods and seeing what happens to their insulin level as a response. And the results are pretty surprising. For example, oatmeal did not raise insulin more than fish or even beef. It's not entirely clear if these differences are statistically significant because they didn't have statistics for each pairwise comparison, but the oatmeal is clearly not larger. It's either there's no significant difference or it's smaller. Apple was about the same as fish. White pasta seemed, if anything, less. And these are all isocaloric. Potato chips, about the same as apple, roughly. Some other foods are more expected. Potatoes had a large response. Jelly beans had the largest. That's more intuitive. But donuts, for example, are about half of that, much closer to fish and apples than the jelly beans. And then beans are real high. So regular beans, like black beans. But lentils are much lower, pretty close to fish and beef. So I don't know anyone who would sign off on this scale to determine which foods are healthy and which ones are not. Everybody would agree on the jelly beans, but after that, it kind of breaks down. Potato chips, fish, lentils, and beef, all around the same range, give or take. Donuts are not much higher than that. White pasta, if anything, is lower. It doesn't match any of the health data we have. One factor that explains some of the observations is that protein can also have an insulinogenic effect. And then there are other factors as well explaining insulin secretion beyond just macros. So this is a pretty sobering reminder that trying to decide which foods are healthy and which ones are not just by the acute oscillation of a biomarker after eating the food is pretty dicey. Big grain of salt anytime someone suggests that. And that goes for acute changes in insulin, glucose, cholesterol, flow-mediated dilation, any of these biomarkers that oscillate after a meal.
not to be confused with a chronic effect like fasting hyperglycemia or chronic hypertension. So a consistent exposure to the risk factor over time. That's what we worry about as far as risk factors. So avoiding high fasting insulin levels, absolutely. And that's mainly done by having a healthy body weight and exercising. But being afraid of a food just because it might change insulin levels acutely after eating it, I haven't seen any compelling evidence that that makes sense. And it might actually be pathologizing a completely normal physiological process. For a lot more on this topic, here's a conversation I had with a diabetes researcher not long ago. And if you want to measure your insulin resistance, here's a video going over several methods to do that, some of them right at home. Check those out. I'll meet you over there. Bye.